this is a discussion on the approach to tachyarrhythmias in children. I hope that the new timing suits you. Uh, I'm, I can see the response from Narayana. I'm pleased that you can hear. So we are going ahead with the class. When you look at major tachyarrhythmias in children, in infants and children, you can look at three types of tachycardia, supraventricular tachycardia and ventricular tachycardia, and these only, but when they occur in special settings, we would deal with them separately. ASVT is the commonest serious arrhythmia in children. The mechanism is a re-entry and um, it is mediated by an accessory pathway in 80% of children and 20% it is AV nodal re-entry. The younger the child, the more likely it is an accessory pathway mediated tachycardia and the older the child, the greater the likelihood of AV nodal re-entry entering as a mechanism. To explain the concept of re-entry to those who are less familiar with electrophysiology, when there is a conduction tissue, which is a fast component and a slow component, it is possible for a premature beat to find the fast conduction block, go down the slow conduction, and then get a circular route established through the fast conducting pathway. As the next slide would show, this would mean that there is an impulse which is coming down the slow pathway and going up the fast pathway, thus establishing a circus movement. And this circus movement is the underlying mechanism for sustaining the tachycardia. From the theory of origin to the actual clinical situations that you deal with, how does an SVT present? Young babies, present with an unexplained sickness. They are just not well. The mother is unable to put her finger and say that this is the problem, but the baby is not well. In an older child, it may be recognized by the parents, or even in a younger child, the fast heart beating or a fast neck pulsation may be noticed by the mother. Or, more dramatically, the baby may present with congestive heart failure or shock. Older children, like adults, can communicate their problem and they do complain of palpitation. Even in older children, parents may be the people who notice the trouble. And when you want to diagnose the tachycardia, the tools available to you begin with history. Say like you want to know the age of onset. Say if a tachycardia was present on day one, it's very likely to be an SVT. Similarly, if a tachycardia is associated with giddiness, it either means it is a ventricular tachycardia or an SVT at a very fast rate. You would very much love to have the ECG during tachycardia. The key information required is the ECG in tachycardia. You would also like to have the ECG in sinus rhythm, which you will anyway get because you are going to do that. And it is very useful if you record what happens when adenosine is given during the actual arrhythmia. A halter recording, an event recorder, an exercise ECG or an esophageal ECG are all things which are of use to you. Excuse me. To look at the types of supraventricular tachycardia, you can think of them as an AV node dependent junctional tachycardia and an AV node independent atrial tachycardia. This is to say that anything involving the AV node would be one set of tachycardia and things which are independent of the AV node have to originate above that in the atrium. So AV node dependent tachycardia would involve the AV nodal reentrant tachycardia the AV reentrant tachycardia using an accessory pathway 
and also the junctional ectopic tachycardia. Among the AV node independent tachycardias, the important ones are the atrial tachycardia, atrial flutter, and atrial fibrillation. One important information that we like to see in the context of analyzing a supraventricular tachycardia is the P wave during the tachycardia. If you watch this ECG, here is the baseline ECG with a nice P wave. Here is the tachycardia ECG without a visible P wave. If there is no visible P wave, it's likely to be a junctional tachycardia. An AV nodal reentrant tachycardia is a form of junctional tachycardia. And if you find that P wave in the ST segment, that is a short RP interval tachycardia. That is the classic feature of an accessory pathway mediated orthodromic supraventricular tachycardia. Mind you, for purposes of analysis, when you say that it's a short RP tachycardia, look at the RP in relation to the RR interval. If it is within the first half of the RR interval, you will call it a short RP tachycardia. Classic example is a orthodromic supraventricular tachycardia using an accessory pathway for the conduction. And a long RP tachycardia, see where the P is, this is where the P is. If RP is that long, it either belongs to the next QRS, making it an ectopic atrial tachycardia, or makes it some specific entity like a permanent form of junctional reciprocating tachycardia uh, or some atypical AV nodal reentry tachycardia. That is when you get a long RP tachycardia. So this illustrates the different possibilities with P wave in tachycardia. And based on P wave, therefore, if you identify a P wave, so perhaps you can start by saying that you are approaching the ECG and there is a P wave or there is no P wave. If there is a P wave of normal morphology, it can't be an arrhythmia. It's a sinus tachycardia. And if there is a pseudo R wave on the V1, by which what we mean is, we will illustrate this again later, the P wave falls so close to the QRS that it seems to disfigure the terminal part of the R wave in V1. So this we would call as as characteristic of AV nodal reentrant tachycardia. And if the P wave is slightly later on the STT segment, that is the feature of AV reentrant tachycardia. So these were the instances when you saw the P wave. A P wave of no normal morphology, sinus tachycardia. Pseudo R wave on V1, AV nodal reentrant tachycardia. <laughs> Excuse me. And uh, P wave on the STT segment, AV reentrant tachycardia. <coughs> I'm sorry. So these are the various possibilities with the P waves. Now, if you look at the mechanisms that are involved, these cartoons represent the various possibilities. Look, here is an accessory pathway. The anti-grade conduction is through the AV node and the retrograde conduction is through the accessory pathway. This is the classic feature of the orthodromic AV reentry tachycardia. <coughs> and in an AV nodal reentry tachycardia, you have the watch this circle here. It means that the the impulse is coming down the slow pathway and going up the fast pathway. That's the classical AV nodal reentry tachycardia. An atrial flutter is illustrated here, atrial ectopic tachycardia here, and a permanent junctional reciprocating tachycardia involves an accessory pathway, and a congenital his bundle tachycardia is an ectopic tachycardia. <coughs> And once again, highlighting the position of the P wave, in an AV reentrant tachycardia, see this cartoon. Here is the P wave. It is a short RP tachycardia. Here is the P wave. And if it is AV nodal reentry, 
this p wave is notching the terminal part of the qrs in v1 and in atrial flutter this can be very deceptive unless you uh, notice the fact that the, there is no baseline or rather the baseline is soft to then uh, you are going to miss the atrial flutter and uh, in the atrial ectopic tachycardia it is a long rp tachycardia there is an ap wave of abnormal morphology in a permanent form of junctional reciprocating tachycardia here again there is a long rp tachycardia with an abnormal p wave morphology which is inverted in 2 3 abs so these are the different possibilities for the p waves and in all the the previous ones the rr interval was regular if the rr interval is irregular the commonest of course is atrial fibrillation but mind you atrial fibrillation is rather uncommon in children the this entity the chaotic or multifocal atrial tachycardia is one where there is an irregular rr interval there are p waves of at least three different morphologies that is what is called a chaotic atrial tachycardia and in a junctional ectopic tachycardia something that uh, many of you are familiar with in the pediatric icu following surgery you find that there is a rr interval which is slightly varying you find the p waves intermittently showing av dissociation so this tachycardia with narrow qrs mild irregularity regarding the rr interval and p waves which make their appearance occasionally suggesting av dissociation is very characteristic of junctional ectopic tachycardia now look at this tachycardia the features of this tachycardia is it is in a narrow qrs tachycardia at about 150 per minute and you can find that the p wave see here it is notching the qrs complex in the terminal part so that is a feature of the common form of av nodal reentrant tachycardia which utilizes the slow pathway for its anti grade conduction and the fast pathway for the retrograde conduction so that was av nodal reentrant tachycardia and the thing to note is the p wave location which is disfiguring the terminal part of the qrs complex look at this this is a much faster tachycardia and um, if you are looking at the p wave here it's on the st segment this is the p wave that we are speaking about i'm not sure it is a uh, very faithfully transmitted but uh, trust me there is a p wave here and that p wave is on the st segment so a fast tachycardia with a p wave on the st segment is a feature and still short rp that is the feature of av reentrant tachycardia and look at this <coughs> and you find a rr interval which is varying because this is atrial flutter and the ratio of av block is varying which is 4 is to 1 in places and 2 is to 1 in places in fact if 4 is to 1 were to alternate with 2 is to 1 you will get a bigenal rhythm here it is irregularly alternating so giving an irregular rr interval but the features that you see are a soft tooth baseline if some fixity in the ratio of the av block even though the two different ratios are seen in this tracing so that's atrial flutter with varying block and this one is again a narrow qrs complex tachycardia and um, we discussed that we need to find the p wave to get us a clue for the diagnosis of the mechanism and here is the p wave So this is a long RP tachycardia, which is either an ectopic atrial tachycardia or a PJRT. The distinction is more often made on clinical grounds and on the actual heart rate. Ectopic atrial tachycardia tends to have a faster heart rate, while PJRT tends to have a heart rate in the range of 150, 160, allowing the tachycardia to perpetuate itself over long periods of time. with this background you can also look at arrhythmias in a different way arrhythmias occurring in the normal heart arrhythmias occurring in the congenitally malformed heart 
and the arrhythmias occurring in the fetus. If you take PJRT, it's a distinct entity which can present as a tachycardiomyopathy because the rate of 150 to 200 closer to 150 allows the tachycardia to go on without interruption and it leads to significant myocardial dysfunction presenting as cardiomyopathy. As we mentioned earlier, the polarity of the P wave, it's inverted in 2-3 AVS and its location, the long RP and the clinical features give you the diagnosis. And this is one entity where RF ablation is indicated and um, RF ablation is very uh, successful. So if you see this, the, the heart rate is in the range of 150 or marginally more and these P waves have been marked here. You have P waves which are inverted in 2-3 AVS with a long RP interval. That is the feature of PJRT. Another specific entity that um, many of you are familiar with in the ICU is the junction electropic tachycardia. It may be congenital, but more often you would see it in the post-op setting, less commonly following a viral myocarditis. The tachycardia has a warming up and cooling down. When the tachycardia uh, begins or intermittently, you find that the RR interval is shorter and then you find that the RR interval is lengthening. This is described as the warm up and the cool down. The P waves may be inverted if there is a regular retrograde atrial capture or they may be upright and intermittent if it is a sinus beat. And um, the treatment, particularly in the postoperative setting, would mean keeping the baby a little on the colder side, minimizing the inotrope use, and using amiodarone as a more definitive therapy. If you see the CCG, it's a narrow QRS complex tachycardia. The rate may be uh, between 150 and 200. And you can find that there are P waves seen in between. See this P wave, here is a P wave, but you don't find a P wave on a regular basis. And that happens because there is AV dissociation. The tachycardia focus, if it is capturing the atrium retrogradely, this will not be the situation. You will have an abnormal P wave morphology with regular P wave. Multifocal atrial tachycardia I already referred to when the atrial rate is more than 100 beats per minute and at least three different P morphologies are seen. All the intervals tend to vary and uh, P waves are separated by isoelectric intervals unlike atrial flutter and the characteristic feature of multifocal atrial tachycardia is its near inevitable association with lung disease and it doesn't settle until the blood gases are normal and that way it is resistant to pharmacotherapy. <laughs> if you see this tracing, look at the, this P wave has one morphology, this is more P and this is much smaller. So there are at least three different P waves in this tracing. So that is multifocal atrial tachycardia. In the context of supraventricular tachycardia, we do need to discuss WPW syndrome. Look at this ECG. What do you find here? You have a short PR interval. You have a positive delta in lead V1 and all the test leads. And this is manifest pre-excitation. Look at this delta. This slurred upstroke is the delta. And the PR interval is obviously short. It is useful to learn to locate where the accessory pathway is based on the surface ECG. You can start by remembering that if there is an RV pre-excitation, it is similar to a left bundle branch block. In left bundle branch block, since the, the bundle branch is blocked, it is the RV gets excited first. So if there is an accessory pathway allowing RV to get excited first, that is similar to left bundle branch block. A left bundle branch block will result in a negative complex in V1 and a positive complex in V6. A right bundle branch block causes the reverse phenomenon. Therefore, 
if you have a negative delta and QRS in V1 in a pre-excitation, it means it is the right ventricle which is being pre-excited because you have a left bundle branch block like morphology. So you start by looking at V1 and the right ventricle pre-excitation is diagnosed by seeing a negative delta wave and QRS in V1. If you find the opposite of this, a positive delta wave and QRS in V1, it means LV is pre-excited. Having made the diagnosis as to which ventricle is getting pre-excited, you see the, uh, the delta waves in 2-3 AVF and the QRS axis. If everything is negative, with a right ventricle pre-excitation, it is a post-troceptal pathway. A left axis deviation is associated with a right free wall pathway and an inferior axis with an anteroceptal pathway. Similarly, with a left ventricle, in everything negative means a post left postroceptal pathway and um, if you have isoelectric or negative delta in anterolateral lead, that, is a, that means it is a lateral pathway. More than half the pathways are actually located on the left free wall and about a quarter are postroceptal, 10 to 20 percent are in the right free wall and the least common are the anteroceptal. This shows what happens when adenosine is given in a WPW syndrome tachycardia. See here there is a narrow QRS complex tachycardia, look at this RR interval, adenosine is being given and there is a bradycardia. So sinus rhythm is restored here, but in sinus rhythm you find that there is a delta wave, not the delta here and this is the feature of WPW syndrome. When the tachycardia is occurring, you find narrow QRS complex tachycardia, you don't recognize the delta because the anti-grade conduction is through the AV node, through the normal conduction tissue and during regular conduction, there is anti-grade conduction through both the pathways initiating the delta wave and that you are able to recognize in sinus rhythm. <coughs> and when the electrophysiologist applies a radio frequency current, what happens is, look at the beginning, there is a delta wave and here normal PR interval, no delta wave. So the EP current has resulted in ablating the pathway. He said the third entity that we would like to discuss is the fetal heart. The mechanisms of tachycardia in the fetal heart would include AV reentrant tachycardia, atrial flutter, PJRT, atrial ectopic tachycardia and rarely multifocal atrial tachycardia. The ways to control this are by giving drugs to the mother so that uh, the drugs would be transferred to the baby across the placenta. Drugs like detoxin, flecainide and sotalol are used for this purpose. If the SVT is persistent, therapy to the mother does not result in termination of the arrhythmia, then you need to consider premature delivery of the baby and this decision would be easier if the gestational age is say about 34 weeks. If there is fetal head drops, you are compelled to recommend early delivery. As against the normal heart, the congenitally malformed heart, certain malformations have a greater association with arrhythmia. The association between Epstein and supraventricular tachycardia is legendary. In character transposition or atrial defect, similarly, you tend to get more frequent arrhythmia. And post-op conditions, certain surgeries like mustard, stenning, where there are extensive atrial suture lines. They form the substrate for intraatrial reentrant tachycardia. Fontan like surgery also gives rise to atrial tachycardia. So, it's only a fallow. Following surgery, you can get either an atrial flutter or you can get ventricular tachycardia. The, when you try to treat these, you must consider the possibilities of LV depression or proarrhythmia. And when you consider the alternatives, they include RF ablation the combining cryoablation along with corrective surgery, 
and procedures like the maze operation for atrial fibrillation. Now we come to the treatment of supraventricular tachycardia. The things that would influence decision making regarding treatment would include the age of the patient, is the heart normal or abnormal, how frequent is the arrhythmia, how long does it last, Symptoms, is it associated with the symptoms of hemodynamic compromise? Is the patient on other drugs? In any case, the personal drug preference of the doctor and the, the culture that you are treating, are people happy to take medicines regularly or they would like to go for an alternate approach faster? These things would influence the drug therapy. So for treatment option, we have vagal maneuvers, antiarrhythmic drugs either IV or oral, or electrical termination either by DC cardioversion, endocardial pacing as you would see in a cap lap scenario arrhythmia, or transesophageal pacing as a surrogate for endocardial pacing in the small baby. In favor of antiarrhythmic drugs, remember they are easy to give, it can be given even in the outpatient clinic and there are many different drugs. Against them, they do not offer cure, there are side effects. Some of them are cardiodepressive, some of them are proarrhythmic, patient compliance would be a problem and you must always think of the interactions the drug has with other drugs. So with all this, when you actually see an SVT, the commonest thing that you do, if a vagal maneuver does not work, I should um, start by saying that, in a small baby, the vagal maneuver that you would employ will be a dive reflex. A dive reflex is elicited by keeping an ice pack or a tissue which contains um, a few uh, a few slops of ice on the baby's nose. This stimulation of the trigeminal nerve uh, would stimulate this reflex arc, and the afferent the efferent limb of this will be mediated by vagus, causing bradycardia. In an older child, you could do a carotid sinus massage. If these things are not working, then you are going ahead with adenosine. And the adenosine, you could give 100 to 500 micrograms per kg as a bolus. We would underline the bolus. The faster you give it, the better it is. And if you have a chance of giving it through a central line, it is better than giving through a peripheral line. A smaller dose works more readily through a central line. Verapamil, which is perhaps the most common drug used in adults, is contraindicated in small children. So below four years, do not use verapamil. And verapamil is also contraindicated at any age if the patient has WPW syndrome. Propranolol can be used at any age. Um, dose is 0.1 milligram per kg. You can consider digitalization in the young infant with recurrent supraventricular tachycardia because adenosine will terminate only one episode of tachycardia and it will not prevent the occurrence of tachycardia later. So if you digitalize the baby, the chance for recurrence decreases. And as I mentioned earlier, verapamil is contraindicated in WPW syndrome and so is digoxin. This contraindication is because both these drugs have a habit of accelerating the accessory pathway conduction. So this makes the baby liable to get faster tachycardia during the uh, actual occurrence of the arrhythmia. <coughs> Excuse me. And drugs like propofenone and flacanide can be given at 0.5 to 2 mg per kg per uh, intravenously or amiodarone 5 mg per kg in 30 minutes followed by an infusion uh, at 0.5 to 1 mg per hour or let's say 10 to 25 microgram per kg per minute. You can cardiovert an arrhythmia associated with hemodynamic disturbance at 0.5 to 1 joules. So if you give adenosine in, the tachy in a tachycardia with a regular narrow QRS complex tachycardia, there are a few things that can occur. Nothing may happen. If nothing happens, it either means that you have given very little drug your delivery has not been proper, you did not give a proper bolus or maybe your tachycardia is not supraventricular. It could be ventricular 
a fascicular tachycardia or a high septal origin tachycardia would have near normal QRS complex. So maybe one of these things has happened. On the other hand, if there is a gradual slowing and then reacceleration, this can happen with any of the atrial rhythms, either a sinus tachycardia or a focal atrial tachycardia, which is a nectopic atrial tachycardia, or a non paroxysmal, that is ectopic junctional tachycardia. With all these, all that would happen is that adenosine will slow down AV nodal conduction. So temporarily the rhythm uh, would slow, the rate would slow down, but the rhythm will not change. And once the adenosine effect uh, is weaned off, the rate just picks up. Or the thing that you want is a sudden termination. This occurs in either an AV nodal reentrant tachycardia or an AV reentrant tachycardia. <coughs> Sometimes uh, some of the focal atrial tachycardias and sinus node reentry tachycardias will also show a slowing rather than abrupt termination. And if you find that the rate has slowed down, but something else is visible now, like an atrial flutter or an atrial tachycardia, the P waves, these become evident when there is an AV block. The next few ECGs illustrate some of these statements. Look at this. Here, the top tracing is an ECG and the lower tracing is a His bundle electrogram. This top tracing shows that here is a QRS and here is a, a P wave which is disfiguring the terminal part, part of the QRS complex. And the His bundle shows this is the ventricular tracing and the ventricular tracing has the atrial tracing superimposed on it. And you are giving adenosine. When you gave adenosine, now look at the ECG. Here is the P wave and here is the QRS. P wave, QRS. So it has terminated and the normal sinus rhythm is restored. And what happened in the His bundle electrogram? You have the normal atrial tracing followed by the ventricular tracing. So that is what happens with adenosine in an AV nodal reentrant tachycardia. And in this tachycardia, here you had a narrow QRS tachycardia at 200 per minute. Maybe you thought it was a junctional tachycardia or an ectopic tachycardia because you couldn't see the P waves very well. You gave adenosine and suddenly you find there are plenty of P waves. So this is either an atrial flutter or since the, there is a baseline between the waves, it is more correct to call it an ectopic atrial tachycardia. <coughs> and if you want options for prevention, the things that you can consider are, should you give a treatment? Supposing there is an SVT once in a year, it lasts few seconds and goes away. It's not worth committing the patient to daily antiarrhythmic therapy. And when you do prescribe antiarrhythmic therapy, like uh, when there is multiple episodes uh, during a month, if we can use a single dose PRN medication, that is one option. So when the, the frequency is not too much, in an older child or an young adult, or older adult for that matter, a tablet like verapamil can be chewed during the episode of tachycardia. That is, uh, the patient may find it easier than taking a regular medication every time. Or of course, we should look at the option of RF ablation. Just to remind you of the Von Williams classification, Remember there is a class 1A, uh, the class 1 is all sodium blockers, class 1A is associated with QT prolongation, class 1B associated with a, no, a, a neutral effect on the QT and class C with shortening of the QT. And class 2 are beta blockers, class 3 are potassium channel blockers associated with QT prolongation and class 4 are calcium channel blockers. And mind you, many newer antiarrhythmic drugs are not covered by the Von Williams classification. So to prevent recurrence of SVT, you have the option of no treatment, in which case you should explain the implication and train the patient. And if you are using drugs for an AV, if you want to involve the AV node, you can use digoxin or class 2, 3, 4 drugs. The, this is because once the AV node is blocked, either an AV nodal reentrant tachycardia 
or an AV reentrant tachycardia can be blocked. And an accessory pathway mediated tachycardia, you could use class 1 C like plakinide or 3 like amiodarone. And if there is WPW, mind you, no digoxin or verapamil. In RF fibrillation, when you consider RF fibrillation, age of the patient, how much hemodynamic disturbance is caused by the tachycardia and the electrophysiologic substrate of the tachycardia uh, to know whether it is an easy thing to RF fibrillate or not. These are the factors which will influence your decision. And when you have an incessant SVT, the common mechanism being a PJRT or an atrial ectopic tachycardia or a congenital jet, the risk is tachycardiomyopathy. And um, the drugs that you would use would include uh, digoxin, amiodarone, flacanide, and RF ablation would be considered based on the age, hemodynamic situation. If there is a cardiac failure, you would go for RF ablation and how well the drug is effect, uh, being effective in the patient or being tolerated and knowledge of the natural history of the arrhythmia. So in favor of our ablation, think that it is a cure and against it is invasive, it has its own complications, radiation and all and there is a question on whether there could be a late recurrence. So below the age of 4 years, you will keep your bar high, the indications are more rigid. So if there is an incessant SVT with a depressed ejection fraction, which is not responding to amiodarone, or a drug refractory SVT, the drug being amiodarone, or a WPW with cardiac arrest, those are pretty rigid indications below the age of 4 years. This is because the risk of the procedure is significant in this age group. Above the age of 4 years, you tend to relax your indications. Of course, incessant SVT would be an indication. But instead of drug refractory SVT, we start speaking of symptomatic SVT. And um, if there is a WPW with syncope, and uh, even if a WPW is asymptomatic, if the effective refractory period is short, which means there is a greater risk of atrial fibrillation with WPW syndrome, this would constitute an indication for RF ablation. And uh, the results of RF fibrillation are generally gratifying for the acute result. There is major complications occur in a small percentage and they are more likely to occur with a smaller weight. And the uh, risk is least with a right free wall accessory pathway and of course with an excellent operator. And so we should always remember that the remedy that we offer should not be worse than the disease. So with this background, now we move on to the white QRS tachycardia, less common than narrow QRS tachycardia in children. But white QRS complex tachycardia, the commonest thing that you consider is of course ventricular tachycardia. We say that VT is rare, but it does occur in children. This would include, the circumstances would include a long QT syndrome, a post cardiac surgery situation and sometimes idiopathic. And rapid deterioration may occur with VT and the treatment would involve intravenous lignocaine, intravenous amiodarone or cardioversion. When you approach a white QRS complex tachycardia, you would like to find out what is the QRS morphology in sinus rhythm. Is the QRS pattern left bundle branch, right bundle branch block or is it an obviously pre-excited one? Are the QRS complexes regular? Are PV seen? And what is the atrioventricular and the ventricular atrial relationship? If you see this uh, cartoon, this illustrates some of the common circumstances in which you would see white QRS complex tachycardia. It could be an SVT with a pre-existing right bundle branch block or left bundle branch block. Think of a, a child with pathology repair developing an SVT. There is an RBBB already, so an SVT will come with an RBBB morphology. Or a child who has had an LVOT resection, if he develops an SVT, of course it will come with a white QRS and an LBBB morphology. As against these, if there is an antidromic AV reentrant tachycardia, that is an accessory pathway 
which is utilized for anti-grade conduction during the tachycardia, that would have a white QRS. Atrial fibrillation with WPW syndrome is a distinct entity. We will discuss it in some detail shortly. Then some of the Mahim fiber tachycardias. These are pathways which exist from the atrium directly to the facetal. And actual ventricular tachycardia. These are the these backgrounds in which you get white QRS tachycardia. So when you find a regular tachycardia with an LBBB pattern of QRS, it could be a pre-existing LBBB and an SVT. It could be an antidromic AVRT with a right-sided accessory pathway. It could be an atriofascicular re-entry on the right side. It could be a ventricular tachycardia arising from the right ventricle. All these will produce an LBB morphology tachycardia. And if it's an RBBB morphology, it could be a pre-existing right bundle branch block and now there is an SVT or it could be a ventricular tachycardia arising from the left ventricle. So look at this ECG. This shows a white QRS complex tachycardia and you will find that the there is a left axis deviation. The Look at lead 1, uh, it is positive and so is AVL which is covered by this um, writing. So you have a white QRS, LBBB morphology and left axis deviation is characteristic of ventricular tachycardia. Look at this. This is again LBBB morphology. Look at V1, it is negative, V6 is positive. But this QRS axis is rightward, it's inferior. This is a characteristic feature of a right ventricular outflow tract tachycardia. This is a ventricular tachycardia which occurs in young adults. Uh, as the term indicates, it originates from the RVOT tachycardia. It is responsive to calcium channel blockers and it is a good result in response to RF ablation. Look at this ECG. You would like to call this a ventricular tachycardia, but you find that the RR intervals are regular. Mind you, in ventricular tachycardia, any irregularity in the RR interval is minor. There is nothing obvious. So if you find a white QRS complex and grossly irregular RR interval, there is only one diagnosis. That is atrial fibrillation with WPW syndrome. It is irregular because the atria are being fired at 400 per minute. Only some of them come down the accessory pathway. As a result, it is irregular. Just as the basic ventricular uh, response is irregular in conventional atrial fibrillation. And it is a white QRS tachycardia because it is a pre excited tachycardia. So, when you find white QRS complex, fast heart rate, and irregular rhythm, the diagnosis is atrial fibrillation with WPW syndrome. And any discussion on ventricular tachycardia in children is incomplete without referring to the long QT syndrome and the tosser D pointers. Today, there is a lot of insight into the genetics of these tachycardias and um, I have referred to the, the genes associated with the most prevalent forms of tachycardia and mind you, the long QT syndrome is an ever expanding one. Uh, at the moment, there are 8 or 10 forms of long QT tachycardia. I am referring only to the common three. It is important to know that the long QT1 is associated with emotional stress. Uh, the occurrence of the major event is associated with emotional stress or swimming. So if you have a syncope following swimming or an extreme emotional upset, it could be long QT1. And in long QT2, it is a sudden auditory stimulus, a loud noise which seems to precipitate it. And in long QT3, the syncope uh, or death is precipitated uh, during sleep and at rest. You don't require exercise for this. So these are the common situations in which arrhythmia is noticed in these three entities. And if you see the typical resting ECG that I would illustrate in the next few slides, long QT1 has a broad T wave. In other words, the prolongation of the QT interval appears to be due to the breadth of the T wave. And the long QT2 
is associated with low amplitude T waves and the, those T waves tend to be nosed and long QT3 tends to be due to a very long ST segment. The T re, uh, is reached only very late to a long isoelectric ST segment. So these are things that help you to identify the type of long QT syndrome which is a prognostic significance and the clinical response to beta blockers is striking in long QT1, less so in long QT2 and very uncertain in long QT3. And uh, if there is a symptomatic uh, arrhythmia in these patients, it is not responding to beta blocker, the, you need to rec recommend an automatic implantable cardioverter defibrillator which could be life saving. Look at uh, these changes in, uh, in the ECG in these entities. You have a normal QT interval illustrated on the top for your convenience. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, you can have this T wave is much broader compared to the normal and uh, there is a U wave added on to the end of it so that the termination of the T wave <coughs> is indistinct. Here the T wave is sinusoidal and slowly generated and here there is a very long ST segment, the characteristic of the uh, long QT3. Here still more uh, forms of um, ECG, wide based slowly generated T wave, the wide based double humped T wave and the low amplitude deflection on the descending limb of the T wave as a TU wave. So, with, so these are the other possibilities in the ECG and what is it that we are worried about in these patients? This ECG illustrates it. The long QT initiates an arrhythmia which is called the tosser D pointer, which means that the tachycardia seems to be undulating around an imaginary baseline, like wound like a spiral. You can imagine a baseline through this and think that the spiral, the something is wound around that baseline. That's the meaning of the word. So I would conclude here. And to conclude, I'll show you some ECGs and ask your opinion on that. Any comments on this ECG? <coughs> no. Well, what you can see is that it is a narrow QRS complex tachycardia, correct? There is some irregularity in the RR interval and you find P waves which are inverted in 2, 3 and AVF. This would suggest that it is a jet. You have a narrow QRS complex tachycardia, some irregularity in the RR interval and you have a T wave which is inverted in 2, 3 and AVF. What has confused you is the relation of the P to the preceding QRS complex. What is happening here in fact is that the RP interval is lengthening and then the P wave is dropped. This is a rare phenomenon of retrograde Wenke back. But if you forget the retrograde Wenke back, you still have a narrow QRS complex tachycardia inverted P in 2, 3 AVF and fairly fast rate with some irregularity. These are features of junctional ectopic tachycardia. So the striking features were the narrow QRS tachycardia, AB dissociation. Uh, the, you will need time to digest that retrograde Wenke back, forget it. But do note that there are P waves seen and all the P waves do not have the same relationship to the QRS complex. Okay, your response to this.
don't get disheartened by the previous ECG. I'm waiting for your response. Well, we have both um, AVRT and AVNRT in the differential diagnosis. Uh, once again, I think you could have a difficulty in identifying the P waves in this. This is a obviously a short RP tachycardia, and if you identify the P waves, it becomes easy. And on the transmission, uh, I'm not sure how easily you identify the P wave, but um, these are the P waves here. So this is a short RP tachycardia. It is an AV reentrant tachycardia. So let's see this. Come on. Pre excitation, you are hallucinating. Could be, yeah, whether this could be an AV reentrant tachycardia. I hope. Any other response? Ah, great. Vikas got it right. So, what you find is, if you notice. So this is to illustrate how easy you can miss atrial flutter. You look at this V3R, you can find the short tooth baseline. So this is a situation where there is an atrial flutter with two is to an AV block. If you are faced with the actual problem in the uh, emergency room or in your ICU, what you could do is to give adenosine, then the flutter waves will become evident and the diagnosis is self-evident then. So we will move to the next one. Very good. This is the PJRT. You can see the the inverted P in two three AVF. The rate is not fast. You can't say on the rate because the grid is not shown. This is the classic uh, PJRT. But mind you, essentially it is a long RP tachycardia in a different setting. The same ECG could pass for an ectopic atrial tachycardia also. So the differential diagnosis of long RP tachycardia and the most likely one being PJRT. So that is what the ECG showed. Now let's see this. It's obviously different from the previous tracings. It's white QRS. So Pangaj, it's white QRS and uh, uh, LBBB. It's um, it's not enough that you say that it is white QRS and LBBB. You need to give a diagnosis. Yes. So practically everybody has diagnosed uh, ventricular tachycardia. Whether you should call it RVOTVT, yes, because you have a uh, rate of about 164 and uh, there is an inferior axis, there is an LBBB morphology. But I also want you to notice this beat. See the beat that is marked? That is a capture beat. In ventricular tachycardia, one of the diagnostic features is if 
uh, you can identify a capture beat or a fusion beat. Remember, during the ventricular tachycardia, the poor sinus node is beating on its own. And the sinus node is generating impulses on its own and capturing the atrium occasionally or maybe even regularly with an AV dissociation. And a fortuitous atrial beat would be able to go down the AV node and capture the ventricle, thereby generating a normal looking complex. And that is what you see here, it's a capture beat. You may also find a beat which is intermediate between normal and the tachycardia beat. That would be called a fusion beat. Recognizing a capture beat or a fusion beat is diagnostic of ventricular tachycardia. Very good. Ah, so you have um, diagnosed not only that it is long QT, that it is type 3 because there is a very long ST segment. Very good. This is a very characteristic uh, tracing of long QT. This is actually a holster trace in a 9 year old girl who had presented this syncope following exercise. And why is syncope? All of you know what this is. Any other response? Yes, it is a tossed. This is a tossed. Uh, you can actually say, I can imagine why you, yeah, the, when you say polymorphic ventricular tachycardia, you are of course a little guarded as to the basis, but a tossed is a polymorphic ventricular tachycardia which follows a pattern. And if you see these leads, the, the characteristic morphology can be made out. So it's a toss aid. And on that note, we would conclude. And if you have any questions, this is the time to ask. <laughs> you wanted the diagram on WPW diagnosis? Okay. Let me get back to it. No, no, WP That is for the three. Any other question? There's no further question, I'm going to wind up. So thank you very much. Hello. Robin? Yes, doctor. We can stop recording? Yeah.